Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Vacuum Transport Seminar. This is our last edition this of this semester, and we are very happy to welcome two interesting guests tonight. Um, so on the one hand, we have Stefan Kirch from Nevomo, and we also have uh, Luis Garcia Taveres um, from CIMAT um, in Spain. And yes, we're very happy to welcome them tonight in the name of all the organizations. So that's um, from, so it's Eurotube, Swiss Loop, the Institute of Hyperloop Technology and Tom Hyperloop and the University of, the Technical University of Munich. Um, so to start off, a quick information again, we use this tool called slider.com where the guests can, where the, um, the viewers can put their questions online during the presentations and then after every presentation we will have a short interaction round and discuss the questions. Um, we will put the details, um, Lucas already put the details into the chat, so thank you very much. Um, so to start off with uh, Stefan Kirch, I would quickly like to hand over to Daniel from Eurotube to give a short introduction about Stefan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Natalie. Also from Eurotube side, uh, welcome everyone to the last edition of the Vacuum Transport Seminars. Today we have uh, the pleasure to welcome Stefan Kirch, who is uh, Chief Business Development Officer at Nivomo. And today uh, he's going to give us a bit of an insight in uh, the current macro technology in Evomo is developing, how the test facility in, in Poland is evolving, and uh, most importantly, um, how this new technology comes into the equation when talking about scalable uh, Hyperloop technologies for, for the future. Um, so, uh, Stefan, I would uh, hand uh, over to you. Thank you very much for joining, and uh, we're looking forward to the, to the talk. Sure, thanks for the introduction. I will just share my screen. Just a second. You can see the slides? Yes, we can see the slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So thanks for inviting me. I will like give you an overview about uh, what we do at Nevomo and um, especially on how we do it and what the current stage of the technology development is and our test track as said by Daniel. Myself, I've, um, I'm working now for Nevomo since like approximately one and a half years. So I started September last year with in Nevomo and before I worked like 15 years for Deutsche Bahn in various uh, managing roles. Uh, yeah, happy to connect on LinkedIn. So I just put my um, LinkedIn profile in the chat. So if you want to stay in touch or have like follow up questions and later on, you will also find me there. Good. So basically, what is Nevomo doing and why are we doing it? So basically, we see ourselves um, as Hyperloop inspired technology enablers for railways. So we plan to upgrade existing railways and why is there a need for upgrading railways? Um, so we see here three problems um, that we want to like solve together with railways. First is railways and I think we can all like see this on the existing European networks in Germany, in Switzerland, in France, like basically everywhere that railways are coming somehow to its capacity limit. And one of the trigger points why it's coming to as a capacity limit is Due to the very analog and very um, limited steel on steel friction inter interface between the wheel and the rails. So, this is somehow inefficient, especially while accelerating and at very high speeds. So, there it has its limitations being part of the capacity limitations of railways. Then, second problems that railways are currently facing is that its technology under the last like two centuries is becoming more and more complex. And this is like lowering the interoperability and has very high transformation costs. So basically, if you want to like change something in railways, it always takes decades and costs you billions of euros. And the third point um, being a challenge within railways is um, if you want to build something new to get new capacity, basically you still have or again have to spend like billions of euros and wait some decades until the new infrastructure is in place with very high capex and very complex uh, deployment times and planning times. Um, so it's basically hard to change anything in railways um, due to the fact that it takes so long and is so cost intensive. 
On the other hand side, like basically railways um, is considered to be like the solution to get rid of those um, CO2 emissions and also like to shift some um, traffic from roads and air transport towards railways. Um, but if everything takes so long, why, um, how should that happen? And basically, besides the uh, competition is quite tough already now in place. So for example, um, road transport for freight has um, 75% market share, railways has 18% market share, and passenger transport road has 80% market share, rail has 8% market share. So that competition is already 10 times stronger. And this is even before having all those innovations that road and air transport are working on um, already in place. Like imagine a world where you could have like an um, electrified autonomous platoon on a road, on a German highway or in France, French highway. This would be basically the better freight train. The same goes like for an automated and self-driving Tesla, isn't that a better TGV or ICE train? It just goes from A to B. So basically railways could be part of the future, but if it doesn't stand up and change now, basically that competition will be even tougher in the next upcoming 10 years. So there's some need for a change now and not in 2040 or 2050 or 2060, as railways is usually like planning 20, 30 years, years ahead. And if rail is not taking that opportunity, then basically also like the European Green Deal is at high risk. So railways won't be able like to get to a market share of 25% with additional capacity. And the same um, goes for the idea of doubling the transport of passengers also by 2030, which will not be able to happen if there's no added capacity. And this is ex exactly like the sweet spot where Nevomo jumps in proposing like its solution. So with our solution, I will go into a bit more detail in a second. We are proposing to upgrade existing railways. So basically like overnight, like in railway timeframes. So this would also like take some time, but not like decades and not spending billions of euros to upgrade it um, when you compare it to like new built um, infrastructure. And with that kind of technology, we think we could increase the capacity of railways. Still this decade, um, we could come from tech complexity to tech simplicity with our um, technology. Um, the implementation itself, as it's an upgrade to existing railways, could be quite fast at lower um, total cost of ownership compared to building something new from the scratch. And that would then help um, to regain the competitive edge for, for railways. So what do we do here? So basically, um, on top of the existing railway infrastructure, we superpose a linear motor stator in between, levitation beams on the side of the infrastructure, as you can see here in the picture, and allow then newly built pods to run on the same infrastructure as existing railways, resulting then in enhanced system performance. So this will allow for um, increased speeds, better travel times um, while using improved acceleration and braking systems, which will also allow for shorter headway distances and then resulting in higher capacity on the same infrastructure just by an upgrade. The system itself is intended to be fully automized. So that will also allow to increase the frequency and flexibility um, of the, of the um, overall network and new efficient operation modes. Um, it's a direct friction, frictionless propulsion system so there are no slippery effects, um, like those slippery effects that you have, for example, in railways. It's quite invulnerable to weather conditions um, due to the direct drive um, coming from the magnetic wave um, towards the vehicle itself. And that would then allow to still achieve the Green Deal CO2 reductions as planned within European Union um, as this goes or could be implemented much faster than deploying additional railway infrastructure in the upcoming decades. And with such kind of technology I've just shown, like on the picture um, before, like the Markwell stage, which is basically reusing four out of three Hyperloop components. So from Hyperloop, we include the pod technology, the magnetic propulsion system, superposed on the existing infrastructure, levitation beams left and right on the side. We just leave away for now the vacuum tube because we think this still needs some time and um, it's also like a quite complex um, technology solution and maybe for some use cases even not needed as for example, um, railways with higher speeds and 
better performance could be way enough to achieve the sustainability and um, shift to rail goals in the upcoming upcoming years. And with that kind of macro technology, um, our simulations show that we could achieve on existing high-speed railway lines speeds up to 550 kilometers an hour, so like double the train speed, but still half the hyperloop speed, um, which would be for most of the connections within Europe, um, like in a dense populated um, continent, way enough um, to have like um, compatible um, travel times between major cities um, all over Europe. And if you reduce it even more, like leave away the pot and the levitation beams and just like implement the linear motor propulsion system and use it with retrofit existing vehicles, we call that macro booster, we could already like bring in um, additional enhancements and benefits towards railways um, to overcome some of those challenges that railways are currently facing, for example, on acceleration times, um, better braking dynamics and overall um, train dynamics and also the, some automation, for example, in yard areas could be already uh, done by micro booster. And then if you take away like linear motor, then you end up like an existing railways. So the other way around, we are proposing basically a stepwise approach from existing legacy infrastructure and legacy railways towards an hyperloop system. And the beautiness of our approach is that all could still work together because basically the new linear motor, like in between as a major device, would be like the ultimate solution to bridge the gaps and bridge the worlds from legacy infrastructure towards an Hyperloop um, future, and which is still con combinable. The Macrail um, solutions in the middle are fully interoperable with existing railways. Well, that means our Macrail pods could approach every train station all over Europe. They could cross every existing switch because we could always run on wheels on those switches as a um, passive levitation system. So basically we, at a certain speed, we are able to levitate, but can always like drop on wheels and cross any switch being a standard switch in a train station, for example, or in high speed switch on some high speed railway line all over Europe. And the same goes for macro booster. If you just reuse the existing vehicles, the retrofitted vehicles, this will um, allow for very low capex costs because basically you just have to attach like a passive element on the existing rolling stock. And these vehicles could still run in every freight yard, on every terminal, in every harbor area, um, adding some additional benefits like automation or as said, like better train dynamics towards the existing railway system. And if it's not working, because this is also um, could be the case like in evolving technologies, so you can just still use the existing system with shunting locomotives or existing rolling stock and nothing basically would happen. So that's basically why the existing railway infrastructure managers and railway undertakings are really embracing the solution. We have some corporations already in place, for example, with Italian railways or um, SNCF announced on stage on Innotrans that they're also going into some cooperation with us. We are cooperating with Duisport which is one of the major European ports, non-sea ports, but inland ports, and further on um, in negotiations. So this is something um, very appreciated by the existing railway infrastructure managers. And that makes the probability of making that happen, in my opinion, much higher, because if we could get the existing railway support, if we could use the networks, superpose it on their networks, we would also like get the political support um, from the governments behind it because all the, of these companies are state-owned companies. So hard to compete against them, but good to cooperate with them. So some use case examples, um, also again, like following the stepwise approach. So for, as said, like macro booster could be implemented also like in just particular parts of the network. So no need to equip like whole lines or um, thousand of kilometers from the start. So for the start, for example, it would be enough to connect, for example, two terminals in half an area with MacRail booster technology. Then you could already like shuttle um, in between those terminals, allowing containers to switch terminals like within first implementation. Or imagine like an enhanced metro system. So like taking the existing metro system in major cities and enhance their capabilities with MacRail booster, for example, accelerating faster um, from platforms, breaking preciser, um, at the platforms to allow for faster boarding and unboarding of people. Such kind of use cases are currently evaluated with railways um, all over Europe. 
Then if you like continue, you could like um, upgrade more and more parts of the lines and also like including the pods, as dedicated pods for special circumstances, allowing them for automated high capacity systems, both for freight and passenger transport and up to like super high speed traffic within the existing network, as said, like up to 550 kilometers an hour. And then if you wanna build new lines, um, then why build heavy existing infrastructure? If the pods are still compatible with the existing railway networks, then you could build like new lines already in macro pure technology, even reduce the infrastructure costs on CAPEX and OPEX more. As the lighter infrastructure would be enough to handle the pods, but the pods itself could still approach Berlin Main Station, Garde l'Est in Paris or Amsterdam Central or whatever, just using the existing railway network and the mark rail infrastructure as it would be um, downwards interoperable. Here at that stage, like existing trains would not be able to operate on pure mark rail infrastructure, but as said, mark rail pods could be still interoperable with existing infrastructure. And then at the later stage, if an Hyperloop system is in place with our technology, we could even bridge um, towards an Hyperloop system. For example, after an Hyperloop tube ends somewhere, for example, I'm located here in Frankfurt, somewhere in the outskirts of Frankfurt, for example, next to the um, 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 train station at the airport, there could be like the lock from the Hyperloop tube. And then the last mile, like the last five, six, eight kilometers, it could use macrail technology to approach the main station as people want to come to the city centers and not to the outskirts. So basically this is, in our opinion, like the stage wise approach. This is all not fiction as we have um, performed like plenty of tests already like in our laboratory in, in Warsaw. Maybe some of you attended like our first demonstration in 2019 showing that one to five um, pot levitating in, in our show event in um, three years ago, um, we have performed mid-scale tests um, for the linear motor propulsion system, power electronics, and the control of the linear motor system, also in our laboratory in Warsaw, um, on real railway infrastructure, just the gorge was a bit smaller, narrower. It was just like a one meter gorge sized um, track, um, more than 100 kilometers long. And we've tested like our pod system NEO3, um, like in the smaller scale on that test track. And we're currently in the final stage of um, equipping our full-scale test track, also in Poland, the southeastern Poland, quite close to the Ukrainian border, unfortunately. So we are even more scared about the war um, there. This is a 750 meter long track. You see it here, um, like an industrial zone. Industrial zone is Czech group, which is some kind of industrial conglomerate in, in Poland. We've rented one of their tracks. It's, as you can see here in the picture, just like ballast track, um, standard railway infrastructure, standard gorge, really outside in a forest. And on that infrastructure, um, we plan to shortly start um, our test regimes with a six meter long pot, two tons heavy, so also no toy. So it's really heavy metal stuff. Um, so basically, if you take like two of those boogies, put a platform on top, you would have like the first levitating freight wagon running on real infrastructure outside of a labor laboratory in the real world. We'll start the test regime soon. We had really hard winter now, like with 60 centimeters of snow in that area. So basically our team is not able like to start the tests because it's all covered in snow, even with the tent, everything is so covered with snow that basically our team cannot go there. We are hopefully the snow will melt down in the next days and then probably right after Christmas, early January, will start testing on the test track. The pot itself is um, also designed as passive levitation pot, will achieve speeds up to 150, 160, maybe even more um, kilometers an hour as in top speed on the just short section of 750 meters, then precise stopping braking system at the end. And then we fly basically back. The pot levitates like two centimeters above the existing infrastructure, then be guided by the levitation beams left and right as said. Um, the same test track will then be, um, as of mid of next year, be retrofitted, including a switch, and we will extend the whole test track to a total length of one and a half, maybe two kilometers, using the money just granted from European Commission, um, as we are now part of the EICA accelerator um, for the grant part um, to, to um, prolong the track. 
And then we will have like the first um, booster showcase probably mid of next year where we have like two freight, standard freight cars, standard freight flat wagons for containers being retrofitted and equipped with our Mark Reboosted technology. And then it could run, they could run like independently on the same infrastructure as a levitating pod, showing that the technology is um, working to prepare them for the last prototype iteration and preparing them for industrialization and home location certification for railways. I'm still discussing like which will be the start market. Um, this is mainly depending on the support that we get from local side and, and customer side. So based on first pre-commercial project that we are working on. And going forward, um, we have the opportunity um, also from our partner um, RFI, which is the Italian infrastructure manager from the state-owned railway company group, FS Group in Italy. And they um, have offered us to um, rebuild um, Bologna San Donato, which is basically the existing rolling stock test track in Italy. And there we could like build up an infrastructure of six, maybe eight kilometers with tracks in parallel, high-speed switches, levitating switches, and everything that we would need to um, homologate and certify Macril then at scale. And yeah, that would be fantastic. We're still waiting here for some Europe rail funds, but also wanna like focus now first on our own test track in Nova Zagina. So this might then happen as a starting point, like 23, 24, um, with first plannings in, in Bologna San Donato. Um, yeah, but this is like more an outlook, like on our technology. So that's it as an interview and I'm ready for some questions, comments. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank yeah. you very much for all of your uh, important, uh, interesting insight. We've already have a lot of questions for you, so I'll just dive right into that. The first question, well, there's three questions that are kind of similar. So mm -hmm. one of them is asking how much would you think you could improve on capacity with MegRail? And then the next one, um, the next two are more on the different speeds of different railways. So yeah. I think we've heard, for example, from Deutsche Bahn in Brussels that the, really the problem is that there's multiple speed, multiple different speeds from different trains running yeah. on the same infrastructure. And that really creates a problem for capacity because maybe they said, that with one ICE um, gone from the tracks, they could basically improve car, uh, or set three cargo trains in that same spot. Yeah. So the question would be, if there's a third railway speed uh, with MagRail, how would that affect capacity um, and yeah. yeah, different frequencies sure. of these trains? Yeah, so the so capacity uh, answer highly depends on the, on the use case that you calculate and evaluate and like on the current operational regime. So we've performed like um, a study on one major freight route in, in Germany that was like intermodal routes from Leipzig via Frankenwald Rampe to Munich. And on that route, we were able like to show that we could increase the capacity by 10 to 20%. It's just an implementation on the inclines so or not the whole route. It would be like just a partial implementation, like out of 500 kilometers, it would be like 12 kilometers of implementation that would already um, increase capacity by 10 to 12%, uh, 10 to so 20%. That's the, that's the booster, booster side. Right, probably, the yeah. booster side with existing rolling stock. And then on the um, um, full macro system, there's no real precise answer yet. Um, here, the um, outcome comes mainly of um, the like shorter headway distances and like in a pure system, we could maybe like double the capacity, but that would mean that there's no existing freight traffic anymore. So somewhere I would say like between double and 10 to 20%, really depending on the operational regime and, and the use case that we, that we could use. In my opinion, like we will not see like pure fully pot systems on, on the European network in the upcoming 10 years. So I would say like 10 to 20, maybe 30% with the existing technologies like as an enhancement, but that would be way enough to shift a lot of um, traffic from road and rail um, towards um, railways. Um, and also like depending on if you could combine some use cases, for example, that incline booster case is like pushing a heavy freight train uphill like a bit faster and without operational stops, no pushing service and so on. And imagine now you could implement the same technology also on passing tracks that would add, add on additional capacity on the same track without any additional retrofit on the, on the, um, on the rolling stock side. So basically the use cases could be summed up and like implementing more and more 
capacity without adding uh, without adding any more like investments, um, on the, at least on the rolling stock side, just on the infrastructure side. So it's a bit like telephone. Uh, um, as more people use are using telephones and the higher the benefit is, and like the first telephone is basically useless, the second one is already good. So basically this is, this is the case, yeah. Regarding the different speeds. Um, so first um, we could run 550, but we don't have to. So basically if you wanna optimize capacity, you could like um, leverage the speeds. If you want to optimize travel time, you could run much faster. So basically in that operation mode and also like um, consider that the infrastructure manager is in full charge by then. So basically the pods just do what the infrastructure says. So basically you could like change the operation scheme to what is needed on that day. So if on that day you need speed because the network is empty, you could uh, allow everybody to travel faster. And on another day, basically when everything is congested, you need more capacity, then you could like homologate the speeds in a much better way because like by just like pushing one button, then basically the network is optimized and all that machine learning AI stuff suddenly makes sense because like one operator is basically doing the whole full operations, not like 400 away we're undertaking, they're just doing what is be best for them on that specific day. So that would also yeah. like- Yeah, uh, that's allow. nice. Yeah. And that second answer, like six rides in this yeah. Of all, yeah. And second answer, which um, is like in the hyperloop com hyperloop community, not the most appreciated answer, but I, I I give it always. Like in freight, it's not about speed. In freight, it's about reliability, frequency, and flexibility. So basically, for a container that is twelve weeks on a container ship, then waiting a week on the stock in Rotterdam or Hamburg Harbor. Why does it have to travel in one hour from Hamburg to Munich? This is just pointless or maybe even ridiculous. And also the, the, these are the, this is a traffic with the lowest margin. So I'm not sure if somebody would pay for such a fast container. And also like the infrastructure would be so huge for container traffic. I cannot imagine that this will ever happen. And for those Europolets, imagine who is now driving with those Europolets through Europe. These are Mercedes sprinters with some um, very specific drivers drinking a lot of Red Bull, not taking any pause, and this is the maximum speed is 160. So basically, and they are transporting a Europolet, I don't know, for 150 euros from Hamburg to Munich um, just yeah. overnight. So I think this, it's not about speed, it's about capacity, flexibility, and reliability and frequency. Mm -hmm. And that's what is needed in, in freight. For passenger, I think um, speed and having higher and better travel times is is um, much more needed yeah also to compete yeah. to to airplanes yeah a great answer uh well we have we have three more questions maybe you can can get them in quick how much uh, could there be in a reduction in cost or energy if you run a mega rail vehicle instead yeah. of normal train for example yeah um nearly similar answer to the capacity question it highly depends on the use case so on that incline use case um to make it short it was um around 10% less energy consumption compared to the next best alternative, which would be like a pushing locomotive or rerouting, which would result in much higher energy consumption. Um, so hard to say, and also hard to compare on those, on those other use cases and costs. If you compare it to adding the same capacity with new build infrastructure, like a greenfield instead of brownfield, and everybody knows that a new high-speed railway infrastructure costs around 35 to 50 million euros our system would be between eight to 10 million euros. So that would be like 30% um, of the costs compared to building something new. If you wanna build it as a greenfield, this would then, then end up maybe at around 12 to 50 million euros because the basic infrastructure doesn't have to be high-speed railway infrastructure to allow for high-speed railways. Um, if you use pods instead of heavy ICE trains or TGV trains, because most of the infrastructure is just needed for those heavy trains and those huge forces. What would be the addition for magnetic levitation uh, for the for the um, for the linear motor propulsion if you set that on the existing infrastructure? How much would that just, cost? What just, would be the just a booster per kilometer? Yeah. Just, just a booster would be around and incline. Uh, yeah, three million euros per kilometer, approximately. Oh, quite cheap <laughs> compared yeah. to everything else. Yeah, yeah. For a private um, person, still a lot of money, but for railways, this is like really nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So and the last question is about how does the guidance of the magnetic levitation work once the pod is in cruising mode and wants to compensate for rail misalign misalignments or how does it want to shift? Yeah. That's the last question. It's magnetic, mag magnetically guided with those levitation beams on the side. So this is also like a passive system. 
And as said, like um, this is taking over um, the, the guidance um, on the track if we are in levitation mode. And basically the wheels are then two centimeters above the existing track and it's magnetically guided um, from the side. Yeah. Oh, great, thank you very much. No questions okay, left. Sure. Thank you Perfect. very much, Stefan. And now Thanks. I will hand over to Natalie to introduce our next speaker, Luis. Thank you very much, Lucas. Um, so yes, as our next speaker, we would like to introduce Luis Garcia Tavares um, Rodriguez um, from CMOT, which stands for Center for Energy, Environmental and Technology, Te Technological Research, which is located in Spain. Um, Luis will talk about switched reluctance machines for applications in energy and transportation. Um, he presents an overview of the switched reluctance machine SRM and includes a conceptual description of some electromagnetic fundamentals, um, which are further classified in um, according to the geometry, magnetic configuration or pole arrangement and the main commercial applications. Um, in his second part, um, he devotes it to the description of three relatively novel applications of the um, switched reluctance machine in either rotary or linear versions, including an application for power leveling in high-speed trains, um, substa substations using a kinetic energy storage system, and another application, which is wave energy conversation. And finally, the last application, which is the Hyperloop type transport system. Um, about Luis, he did his PhD in electrical engineering and started his career um, working on power electronics and power systems for high-speed trains. And he's currently the head of electrical engineering division at CMOT um, with two core activities, the energy generation and management of particle accelerators. Um, and he has also been lecturing electrical machines for more than 10 years at the Universidad um, um, Pontificia de Comillas. So thank you very much, Luis, for joining our seminar. And I would like to hand over to you and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much to you, Natalie. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, yeah, we can. Okay, can you? We do, we do, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, well then, uh, thank you very much again for this uh, presentation and thank you very much above all for inviting me to the to the seminar. I am really delighted to talk about switches to Latin's machine and to uh, talk about our activities in this uh, in, in this subject. We've been working for more than 20 years in this in, in, in uh, switches to Latin's machine. We've done quite a number of activities. I am really glad to um, disseminate and to talk about these things. Um, let me just put the pointer on before I start. Okay, here it is. Um, so the, um, let's say the menu for today will be, as Natalie already said, to talk about switched reluctance machine. I don't know how much familiar you are with this type of machines, but um, I'll try to start from the very beginning. So I will start by defining which is the fundamentals of this type of machine. And, and then uh, with these fundamentals, I will try to describe which are the pros and the cons of this type of machine. And then I will try to classify them according to the different topologies and the different geometries they have. And that will be um, the subject for the first part. And for the second one, I will try to describe three applications that we've done using these uh, machines. One is related to, um, one is related to high speed transportation. Uh, the second is related to energy conversion and the uh, wave energy conversion. And the third is related to energy storage. I say, I will try because I'm not sure in 20 minutes I will be able to describe all the things that I want to say. So I will try with the first part and then at least I promise you that I will finish with the, with the, with the uh, application concerning transportation, which is the one interesting for you. In any case, I will just mention the other two. Um, give me one minute to present my institute. Uh, I come from Tiamat, as Natalie said. It is a, a research, a public research institute, which um, it is um, ascribed to the Ministry of Science and Innovation, uh, 1300 people and about 100 million um, annual budget. It is located in different places in Spain, but I would say that at least 80% of the 
activities and the people is concentrated in Madrid. And finally, it is obviously divided into different management and scientific departments. And one of these department, scientific department is the technology department at which the um, electrical engineering division is um, ascribed. Basically what we do in this division, as Natalie uh, already said, is uh, on the one hand particle accelerators and on the other hand um, energy which again is uh, <clears throat> composed by activities related to um, generation storage and transportation okay so coming to the subject and the subject of the switched reluctance machine the first question is where is the switched reluctance machine located in the universe of electrical machines you know that there are many types of uh, many different types of electrical machines. You know that they can be classified in different ways. And here I can here I present the, one of the uh, proposals by my professor Miller. But there are very many differences of classifying the machine. It's not the moment of uh, of um, giving details about this. But what I can say is that a switched reluctance machine is characterized by three main features. The first one is that, uh, well, you know, first of all, I have to say that, you know, probably that every machine has two sides. One is usually called the stator and the other is called rotor. If it is a rotary machine or translator, if it is, if it is a, a linear machine. And the first uh, feature of this type of machine is that one of the sides, the passive side, is fully passive. That means that there are no coils, no permanent magnets, no induced currents in any conductor, nothing, just a pure piece of iron. And um, the second feature is that um, the number of poles um, uh, in for every side is different, must be different. And this is unlike the rest of the machine, which, uh, with, uh, which all have a, a, an equal number of poles. And the third feature is that they are quite stupid in the sense that they need a power converter to work, which is not the case, for example, for the induction machine or for the synchronous machine or even for the DC machine, which in principle can be directly connected to the grid. Normally it's not the case, but the switched reluctance machine always needs a power converter and the corresponding control system to work. How does it work then? Which is the working principle? I, I, I always like to tell my, my visitors or my students that the working principle of the switched reluctance machine is the one corresponding to the donkey and the carrot. You know that if you put a carrot ahead of the donkey, it will try to eat the carrot, it will try to follow to keep going and trying to buy the carrot. Here, the donkey is a rotor in this case, the pink part of the machine and the, and the carrot is the coil, the corresponding coil. So once the pole, so you see every time a pole is under the coil, then it is switched on. And then when the coil and the pole are fully aligned, the coil is again switched off and then the next coil is switched on. And this keeps going on and on. This is so for the rotary version, but it's exactly the same for the linear version as well. As I said before, the number of poles in the, road, in, in the rotor and the stator must be different. And uh, at the end, the three numbers that characterize a switched reluctance machine are the number of faces, M, the number of poles in the stator, and S, and the number of poles in the rotor, and R. One um, interesting, important, significant magnitude of this type of machine is the displacement, either the linear or the angular displacement, which is the, uh, which is the angle or the displacement, sorry, just is called, which is produced every time there is a commutation of one phase. So you see that if you want to, you see that it is inversely proportional to the number of phases and to the number of rotor poles. If you want to make a fast machine, those two numbers must be small because otherwise you will need a very high frequency and the commutation losses should be very high. So fast machine need a low number of phases and a low number of pole rates. In this case, for instance, you have three phases the blue, the green, and the red, six poles for the stator and four poles for the rotor. 
Okay, how the force on the torque is produced in a switch reluctance machine? Well, before answering that question, we need to know how the other important element of the, of the machine works, which is a power converter. If you remember, I just said that this machine is quite a stupid. It needs anyhow a, um, a converter. And um, without going into much detail, this converter is based on this so-called H bridge topology. So you have one type of one um, set of these converters for every phase of the machine. This is a three state device, depending on whether, well, first of all, it has two switches in the main diagonal and two diodes in the other diagonal. If the switches are on, then the polarity in the coil, or not just in the one coil, but in all the coils corresponding to one phase, which are connected in series, it will be positive. If the switches are off and the diodes are on, then it will be negative because this same point will be connected to the minus instead of being connected to the plus. And if one diode is connected and the corresponding switch is connected as well, then the coil will be short circuited and the voltage across that will be zero. So you have plus, uh, voltage minus voltage or zero voltage and, and, the, and the coil will be sorted. And with these values, with these three values of the voltage, you try to control the current and to make it custom. A little bit of mathematics, but very simple mathematics, just, just to try to understand or to derive an expression for the torque. And it can be, it can be deduced from the overall energy, which is supplied by the power supply. It will be the integral of the power in the full period. And the power will be obviously the product of the voltage times the current. If you neglect the resistive part of the voltage, then it will be completely inductive. And so the energy will be given by this simple equation. And at the end, it will be the closed integral of the current differential flux. So you can, you can make a um, geometrical representation of the value of the energy, considering how the flux, the flux across the coil evolves with the current. And the area which is enclosed by this evolution of the flux will give you the energy, the overall energy that the um, power supply is providing to the, man, to the coil, to the machine itself. From the energy, you can derive the power, simply divided by the uh, period. And uh, from the power, you can derive the force simply dividing by the velocity of the machine. And at the end, you will have this simple formula, which is very simple, it's very conceptual, but it's not very practical because at the end, the determination of this cosine is quite cumbersome. But it tells you one important thing. This cosine, by the way, is the proportion of the area compared to the proportion of the rectangle, okay? To the involving rectangle uh, in the figure. So at the end, what you try to do is to make this constant as close as one as possible. And so you will have that the power will be the power, the power will be the product of the, um, of the magnetic field time the, times the current. And this constant must be as close to one as possible. And being close to one means that this side of the curve should be as close as the x axis as possible. And this one in here should be as close as this line as possible. And in terms, in physical terms, what I'm trying to say is that the self-inductance of the machine in the non-aligned position should be small, and the self-inductance of the machine in the aligned position should be also small, at least for high currents. And this means that the machine should be saturated as much as possible. Okay, so with this uh, basic uh, principles of how a switched reluctance machine works, we can make a list of advantages and disadvantages. In the list of advantages, the first one is that it's very simple and robust. And if it is simple and robust, it means that it's, it's cheap. It's a low cost machine. The second one is that there is no possibility of producing a shoot through fault in the converter because there are no two switches connected in series. You, if you remember, the topology of the converter, you have a switch and a diode. So you can never make a, a short circuit between them. 
The losses are only concentrated on the stator, and this means that uh, it is easier to cool than other types of, of, of machine. The starting torque can be very high because the current can be very high. There is no open circuit voltage, and this means that uh, you have no uh, danger of electrocution when you are handling the machine. The maximum rotor temperature could be quite high, and this means that because you, are, you don't have permanent magnets, so you can allow to increase the current, the temperature, sorry. The inertia of the rotor can be very small because you have no coils, no magnets, and the geometry is quite far away from a, from a complete cylinder. And this means that the dynamic response of the, of the machine can be very good. And finally, you can work at very high, extremely high speeds because you have no permanent magnets or nothing that could be destroyed. But not all are advantages. You have also disadvantages. They have, the first disadvantage is that there is a high torque ripple due to the overlapping of the commutation of the different phases. You have acoustic noise, which comes basically from the radial forces. And this is a problem, a big problem, I mean. As you have ripple in the current, that means that you need bigger capacitors. So the filters are bigger than in the standard other for the other machines. The machine on the converter must be oversized because there is a certain, there is a kind of consumption of reactive power. And this means that you need, for the same amount of force, you need more um, current than what you need for a permanent magnet machine. And if you need more current, that means that you have more, more losses. Consequently, it is less efficient in principle than the permanent magnet uh, machine. Um, the torque ripple minimis, minimis, minimization can be well, it implies that uh, you need a more complex control. So the, co the control can be more complex than for any other type of machine. In any case, it's a good machine. It's a very interesting machine. And oh, sorry, I forgot to say one thing which is extremely important, which is this, this uh, advantage in here. There are independent stator phases. And this means that if you have um, a switched reluctance machine, with only one phase working, it will keep going, okay? So it can be extremely convenient for safety reasons. You can work with a machine with only one phase of the machine, which is not the case, for instance, for a three-phase machine. So I was saying that although the switch reluctance machine is not very popular, perhaps in the sense that, or not popular, but perhaps it's not very well known, the applications of this uh, machine are quite well known. And you can find many, 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 especially home appliances, which uh, have are based on switched reluctance machine. Just some examples and a bit out of time, so I won't uh, be very, I won't devote much time on this, but uh, who doesn't have a thermomix at home, for instance? It, it is based on a switched reluctance machine. The same, for instance, with the decent vacuum cleaner, which is based on one of the fastest mo motors in the world, based on a switched reluctance machine. Many, many washing machines are based on switched reluctance machine. Centrifuge are based on switched reluctance machine. Turbochargers, some uh, manufacturers uh, base them or switch on switched reluctance machine, and they avoid mechanical collisions, connections in order to increase the dynamic response of the machine. So there are a great number of, of applications of this type of machine. And just to finish this um, first uh, conceptual part of the switcher reluctance machine, um, a, brief, a, a, a comprehensive classification of them. Depending on the geometry, they can be rotary or they can be linear. Obviously, um, if they are linear, they can be single-sided, they can be double-sided, they can be cylindrical, or they can be even different. And in fact, for instance, we have invented, let's say, two new types of linear uh, reluctance machine. According to the, um, to the field um, path, to the field geometry, they can be radial. In this case, the field will go, the flux will go like this, radially, and they will close azimutally, and they will come back radially. Or they can be actual flux machine in which the flux will go vertically and they it will close azimutally and they will it go will it will go back uh, vertically. And concerning the structure of the path of the of the flux, it can be pull pull path. In this case, you have uh, the flux coming out from one pole, 
it will go to the diametrically opposite pole and it will close through the iron yoke azimutally. This uh, system, this machine has the disadvantage of uh, have a long flux path, which means more losses, or it can be partial or short flux path in which the flux come from one adjacent point to the one pole to the adjacent one. And in this case, this, the, the length is much shorter. The problem in this case is that while here the radial forces are fully compensated because the radial force in here is the same as it is in here, in this case you have no compensation of the radial forces and then you have to increase the number of poles so you have uh, different problems. And finally you can introduce permanent magnets on the poles and then you can make, you can increase the flux and you can make what is called a vernier machine. Okay, so um, let me go some minutes to, uh, I said before that I have three applications, at least, at least let me explain the application concerning Hyperloop. Celeros, and I see that Guillermo is present in the conference, is um, developing a system which is based on different, on, 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 the, on the following, let's say, features. Capacity for between, I don't know if these features are really updated. I think they, they are something like uh, one or two years old, but I think more or less, they are, if they are not updated, I think they are close to the end. So the capacity of the vehicle should be in the range of 20, 50 to 20, 200 passengers. Um, there will be a residual pressure in the tube in the order of uh, 100 millibars. The cruise speed will be between 600 and 750 kilometers per hour. It is prepared by a compressor powered by electrical motor with a power concession in the range from 7 to 13 megawatts. All the power for the propulsion system sits on board. And in order to accelerate the machine to nominal speed, there has to be a system, um, a linear motor at the end with a length in the range from six to 15 kilometer long, providing an acceleration, a maximum acceleration up to three meters square second. And this system must be, uh, must provide a regenerative braking system for launching other vehicles. So we started the collaboration about four years ago with them. And the first activity of this collaboration was trying to identify which could be the best system, the best solution for making this accelerating system. So the first question we had to answer is, should it be electrical or mechanical? Obviously, in this case, it is an easy question. And the answer should be electrical because the system Hyperloop is basically an electrical device and it has no sense to introduce a mechanical system in there. So the second question is, should it be a long or a short stator? A long stator means that the coils, given the, 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 the active power, are located in the, in the track, while a short stator means that they are located in the vehicle. And the answer to this was, it should be long, because if we put it in the vehicle, we have to feed these coils at a very high speed. It doesn't seem to be a clear solution for fitting them. Otherwise you will have to put all the energy which is required in the vehicle. And at the end, you will transport batteries rather than people. So the answer was a long stable. And basically, again, there are three options for this. It could be a linear induction machine. It could be a linear switch reluctance machine, or it could be a linear permanent magnet machine. I'm not going to go into, into detail, but basically the two first are simple and robust, obviously. The two first have no magnets, and, but this one has heat dissipation in the stator, which we don't want it. It has a low power factor and the efficiency due to the end effects is lower. In this case, it is a modular machine. It can be extremely um, simple and low cost, taking into account that we are talking about the state or a long state or solution, but we have the problem of vibration and above all, the problems concerning the lateral force. While the linear permanent magnet has the problem of the magnets, it's a wonderful machine with a very high performance, but you require permanent magnets, which is something that we try to avoid. We have been working with, um, and now in, in fact, we are working with them, with Aleros, in, um, in, a, in a project, which is a, a Eurostar project, which is led by them with a two-folded mission. On the one hand, 
testing being a kind of pre-prototype of, of a more complex solution in the future. And um, the idea is to launch this machine um, with a weight in the, in the range of 250 kilograms at the speed on 150 kilometers per hour. While the second case, the second mission is to test um, cargo freight, uh, what is called a freight forwarder, trying to move uh, in the range of one ton at the speed of 40 kilometers per hour. The solution taken for, for this, by the way, this, this, this system is, is about to be finished. It should be commissioned, starting the commission in uh, this month and is starting the installation in, in the real test uh, site, which is the Sagunto port in uh, January next year. And it is based on a three phase switched reluctance machine. It is a full flux machine, three phase, uh, three phase six poles and poles in the stator and four in the stator. And uh, here you see the arrangement, the structure, in blue the stator, in red the uh, translator, and, um, and uh, what else? Yes, the final arrangement corresponding to the, to the power um, converter. You have the grid, electrical grid, you have a grid side converter, then you establish a DC link, and then you have the machine power converter. And since you are not able to feed all the track at the same time, obviously, you need to sectorize this track. And for this, we have, the, or they have developed um, a kind of a commutator, which is based on thyristors, which fits sequentially the different sectors of the track. This finishes the part corresponding to the, uh, if you give me one more minute, I will go very fast through the energy generation of the other application. If not, Natalie, I stop here. Uh, tell me. I think it will be interesting. Please, please go ahead. I think it will be nice. Okay, I will try to be faster in this case. For energy generation, we have developed a system in order to extract energy, to convert energy from the waves. We use something which is called a wave energy converter, and this needs something which is called a PTO, power takeoff system. And this uh, can be uh, hydraulic, can be pneumatic, or can be electric. In our case, since we need a very high efficiency, we prefer to, to put electric guided drive system. Um, and I'm going to go into details how it works. It, it, it is a really complex problem. Uh, basically, what you have is a float which is following the movement of the waves going up and down. This float is connected to the translator of a linear machine. And the other part of the machine, which is this one, is fixed to a fixed structure, which is called the spar. Um, if you use the models, if you modelize this system, you find something which is very interesting. The maximum energy that you can extract is quite, uh, is quite cost. This is for a given wave energy converter. And it's quite custom, but the problem is that as you, uh, I mean, this what you are representing here is the period of the waves. Uh, while you get more and more, you get um, far from the resonant frequency of the system, the force that you need to extract this energy increases and increases. And at the end, you can, you are not able because you have a, a, a real PTO with a limited force. So you are not able to extract all the energy which is available in the, in the, in the waves. And you get this kind of miserable curve if you really use a low force um, converter. So we need to design something with a high force. And for this, we invented two types of, uh, sorry, we invented two types of linear uh, switcher reluctance machine. The first one is a linear machine in which we introduce intermediate um, state, uh, stators. But the, the, the trick here is that while these N stators need a lot of iron because they have to close the, the circuit, the magnetic flux circuit, these intermediate ones do not need a big amount of iron. So because they are in the way, in the path of the flux. So by introducing this system, you double the force of the system, but you don't double the weight of the machine. And what you do is increasing the uh, specific force. So we developed about 10 years ago, this huge machine. This is something like 12 meter long. You see me at the end, and this is inside this wave energy converter. And in the limit, 
you can make all this all the stators being intermediate by making a round cylindrical machine. So you get rid of the um, end um, stators, so you get the 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 lightest possible machine, uh, switcher lattice machine that you can achieve. And this is, is that was done uh, about two, three years ago in a European project. And now we have the machine substituting this one and being ready for being tested. And uh, quickly about the, um, the other application in, for, for leveling uh, the power consumption of substation in high speed trains in Spain. This is a project that was done about 15 years ago. And uh, before when just at the beginning of the highest speed in Spain, the highest speed system in Spain, what is called the AVE. And uh, basically the concept is very simple. If you don't have any type of uh, flywheel, then the consumption by the substation will be as a function of the number of trains which are inside the sector. For instance, if you have two trains, then the consumption will be two units of power. Then if you have one train, it will be just one unit. If, if, if you have no train, it will be no consumption. So you have an average power of one, but you have peaks of two. If you put um, a, 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 a flywheel system or you put a, an energy storage system, then at this moment you will, one unit of power will be given by the, by the storage system and the other will be, be uh, given by the substation. Here, all the power will be given by the substation and here the substation will recharge the flywheel. So at the end, the average power will be the same one, but you have get rid of the you got rid of the of the power peaks, okay? And this means that the dimensioning of the of the uh, substation can be much smaller. So about twenty years ago, more than twenty years ago, we started the program for making switched reluctance machine. This is our first switched reluctance machine. It is really a toy, if you see, with the corresponding power converter. And since then, we have been increasing the sizes, the power, and the energy of the uh, switched reluctance machine until we achieve this huge uh, monster, which is a flywheel, which is already uh, working in a, in, a, in a substation, in a high-speed train substation. So we've done uh, to values of 200 megajoule, 350 kV, um, kilovolts amps, and um, working at the speed of uh, above uh, 6,000 RPMs. At the end, we have realized that two big flywheels are not very convenient and we have reduced the sizes of the machine. So we prefer to work on the concept of mechanical batteries in which you can very easily, um, how to say, separate the energy and the power that you need uh, you need to increase, you have to increase the number of, 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 uh, of uh, machines, but at the end it's much more robust and much more reliable. These are for instance, a collection of the three types of machine that we have developed. And uh, just to finish the last transparency corresponding to the, our facilities, they are located in Madrid. It is a medium sized lab uh, where we test um, power electronics equipment, where we test linear, big linear machines, and there is a, a pit inside in which we test uh, also flywheels. So, well, just to summarize, I think um, the conclusions are obvious. We are five minutes uh, out of time, so I think I can finish here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Luis. It was very interesting. Thank you very much for the insight. Um, Thank you very much. I really yeah. appreciate it. Um, I would I like to hand can... over to Lucas, yes, for short inter um, question round. Thank you. Yeah, I think we can keep up your summary and conclusion here for everybody to read um, um, while we do the questions. Um, so the first question uh, there is, which kind of motor do you think uh, will prevail for Hyperloop? But I think we've already seen your comparison with all the uh, pros and cons uh, on your slides. So and you're probably looking forward to the switch reluctance motor, I guess. Well, I, I wouldn't dare to 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 um, to propose a, a, a single solution. I mean, I have. I mean, you have to investigate them all. Um, each has uh, advantages and, and disadvantages, and I wouldn't dare to say without testing them all that this one is better than that one. 
Yeah, and maybe there's a different solution for cruising than for accelerating because of different power needs there are. And you are right. You are right. You are right. If you're going to if you're going to move at very low speed, for instance, you 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 should put the coils. You shouldn't use the long state or resolution because at the end you can feed the easily. You can feed the the coils and uh, or you can charge uh, with batteries or whatever, and then it will be a much simpler solution to put the coils on the train or the vehicle. Uh, so it depends a lot of uh, the final, the final, um, the final mission of the of the machine. Yeah, layout of operations of the system. And then the second question is, what's the efficiency for the switched reluctance motor across different speeds, and how does that compare to, no, for this, example, this, the this we don't know. linear this, machines? This we don't know yet. I mean, until we we finish the test, uh, we don't know which is going to be the final. Uh, for the case of the wave energy, for instance, we have achieved very high efficiencies, very high efficiencies where I'm talking about a very low speed machine, which is inherently has no very poor efficiency. So we have achieved something like 80%, which is a lot, talking about a one, million, a one meter per second uh, speed machine. But for these type of things, we have to test and we have to, well, we have to, to fabricate and to test and to, and to calculate which is the efficiency. Do you already know what uh, you want to improve for the switched reluctance motor for high speed rail or hyperloop? What what the improvement would well, be for the main, high speed? The main issue clearly is are the lateral forces, and uh, this is something we have to analyze. Uh, we we have uh, some uh, some ideas for instance, not not for this, but we for instance, one of the things if, if you let me in, um, if you let me just to put an example, if you let me go to the first. Um, Respond to the cover page. You see, this, uh, for instance, is uh, this is the classical solution in which the width of the iron is this high, and this is um, an improved solution in which you can reduce the uh, width of the iron by a factor of two. For a 10 kilometer or a 15 kilometer machine, this is very important because you save a lot of weight and a, and a lot of money. So this is the type of things that we did. But but the um, today the crucial point is or are the lateral forces, and uh, because you have to be extremely careful with the um, alignment of the machine and with the and the machine has to be extremely well centered so that an air gap at the one side is not bigger than at the other because this will induce additional lateral forces. But, well, not additional, lateral forces. If it is fully balanced, there are no forces. But it is, it is, if it is not balanced, there will be forces. So I think the, let's have the last question and because that's very important um, for, for, the, for the machine. Uh, how would you solve the problem of vibration and noise in the reluctance motor at higher speed? So that's one of the questions, one of the last ones here in the chat. What, what well, do you have to do with the noise... vibrations and noise? Yes, the problem of the noise. If you are speaking about if you are speaking about rotary machine, the problem of the noise is a pure mechanical problem. It's a pure structural problem. What you have in 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 in, in this kind of machine is that you have lateral, you have radial forces, and this deform the structure. And when the structure, when the coil is switched off, the force disappears. So the uh, the structure uh, wants to vibrate and this produce noises. Some part of the noise comes from the ripple of the torque, but this is not the important point. The important point is basically the deformation of the structure. And, to, and this is basically uh, achieved by um, somehow putting a special support, increasing the width, these sort of things. But it is uh, basically a mechanical problem. Well. So we just uh, threw a couple of engineers at it and let's see how we solve it. Well, thank you very yes, much. Yes, well, usually the products of the, yeah, you, you know that in, in, in all my activities, uh, they used to say that the products of electricity are really mechanical. Well, great, great to hear that. So I think hopefully we'll solve them uh, at the end. Thank you very much, Luis, for your presentation. Thank you very much for, for all of the insights. Um, I've heard you've already had a, had a couple of meetings today where you've discussed uh, some linear motors, um, and I would just hand over to Natalie now to finish off the yes, seminar. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I want um, to visit the. Yeah, sorry, sorry. No, no, go ahead. 
No, no, I, I was saying I want to visit uh, today. Uh, I, I, I visited um, uh, Swiss Loop on um, YouTube, and it was, uh, they, they both were extremely interesting, this interesting uh, visits. And uh, the one in, in Swiss Loop was um, especially, in, how to say, I mean, we, we have developed something which is very similar. Both solutions are based on a switch reluctance machine. And it's always um, joyful to, to find someone who has found the same solution or made the same mistake. I don't know yet. <laughs> well, I would say that's a compliment to, to the other <laughs> co-hosts co here. Um, I would just turn it over to Natalie now for the, for the end. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis, also for your visit um, at Eurotube and Swiss Loop in Switzerland. It's, I think it's really nice if this exchange is also taking place in person. Yes, yes. I, I told guess. them that uh, we are open to any any type of collaboration. And if you want to, I mean, if, if you want to share ex experiences, uh, we are fully open to that. And um, as I said before, it's, 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 it's very encouraging to find someone who is doing similar things and finding the same problems. To you. Just you. This is very nice. Thank you very much for your visit. And also, thank you very much for your contribution to the present with the presentation to our seminar. Um, also, again, thank you very much to Stefan Krich from um, Nevomo for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting um, me. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so as it was already announced at the beginning uh, of this seminar, this was already the last edition of this semester. Um, so we're already, already through. And of course, we plan to continue the, sem the seminar again next as of next semester, um, which is always a bit um, a challenge to find the dates because the semesters in Switzerland and in Germany are not overlapping or are just overlapping at a small period. So um, we will announce the new seminar start then as soon as possible on our social medias and on our website. And I would also like to take this um, opportunity to quickly look back on when the seminar started. So we started um, almost three years ago. So this was now the sixth semester that this seminar took place. We built the seminar in 2020, um, just shortly before the pandemic hit Europe. Um, it was Eurotube and Swiss Loop who founded the seminar. Um, I could have been part of the seminar from the early beginning on, and it's really nice to see how this, where the seminar now led and what we achieved with the seminar. And Yes, uh, well, for me, it's now time to hand over my position to the next generation of Swiss Loop, there, that there will be a new person representing Swiss Loop in this uh, seminar construct or um, yeah, collaboration. And yeah, I just want to take this time to thank everyone who participated, who helped to build this seminar. It was really, really nice journey three years um, to accompany and build this seminar. And I'm really happy to where we, where we got to and what we built and constructed with this seminar. And just to repeat again, the goal of the seminar is exactly to build this platform for exchange and collaboration, um, which I think we're really on a good track and we already did a lot. And I'm sure the ones who will continue will yeah, keep pushing even more into this direction. So I want to thank everyone, everyone who presented in the seminar and everyone who helped also from the other organizations yeah. from your Institute of Hyperloop Technology, Eurotube, and Tom Hyperloop. Yeah, it was really great. And I hope one we can see each other soon at another point or another for an upper opportunity. So thank you very much to everyone. And yeah, see you soon. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Natalie. Then hope to see you soon uh, next time as a uh, attendee on the other side of the screen. So yeah, we're looking forward to that. And also from YouTube side, uh, thank you very much for participating and uh, we're looking forward to the next edition already. The interesting topics and more insights into what is uh, coming up for 2023, which is uh, not not few few things. Great. Yeah, thank you exactly. very much. Thank you very much, Natalie, and all of you looking forward to the next seminar, to the next sessions. I'm looking forward to it. Nice. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very and much, everyone. Happy Bye. Christmas. Bye. Good evening. Have nice holidays. Happy, happy Christmas, everybody. Yes. Good, goodbye, everyone. Bye. Happy holidays and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>